Good afternoon and welcome. We are so incredibly happy to have you here joining us today for the 2021 Technology Conference, the fast forward a decade of change in a year. Um, you are here for session C4, that is librarian plus research equals learning. We have with us here today our fabulous presenters, Ms. Allison Moe and Ms. Deb Speck. And you're also gonna be hearing from Amy Armbruster talking all about what research looks like, the works of librarians and how that relates to learning. So we are ecstatic to have you here with us today. Before we kick off our presentation, I want to go through a couple of housekeeping rules with you. So as always, use the chat box to communicate with one another. If this is your first time here, you're gonna click into the chat area and create a channel, and then you'll be able to chat with others, ask questions of our presenters, um, and engage in this opportunity. This session, of course, will be recorded, and it will be available on the conference platform for about 30 days on the YouTube channel for the life of the channel. Um, so please remember um, to keep it going. Remind, um, just a reminder to like the video and subscribe to the channel, which is EdTech Team. And lastly, before we move on, we would love to see where you are learning from. How are you engaging with us today? We wanna hear some of the things that really spoke to you throughout the session. So please use the hashtag PBCTechConf on Twitter and be sure to tag the EdTech Team at, at EdTechPBC.com. Uh, at PBC. So you'll see both of those right up there in the top right corner. Um, so please uh, engage with us today, keep that learning going, and we want to make sure that we hear from you. So without further ado, I'm going to share with you um, our first presentation of the day. We are going to be hearing from the fabulous Allison Mo. Um, and so Allison, kick it off. We're excited to hear from you. Great, thank you, Eva, and welcome everyone. Um, this presentation, that this part that I am gonna do, actually deals with kind of a background presentation that um, I use at my school. I collaborate with teachers, and we have ACE teachers, AP teachers, of course, regular content teachers, um, and those that do research projects, I usually collaborate with them to see what their needs are, and then I, do something such as this with the students, just to give them idea of background. So I'm from San Lucius High School, which is in uh, Western Lake Worth in Palm Beach County, Florida, for those of you that might be joining us from other places. Um, Deb, Amy, and I also get to collaborate together in a um, Saturday forum. We have a TLC group, that uh, we we get together and we collaborate amongst other librarians to discuss different things that we do with our students. So we're always collaborating um, with other media specialists, which is quite helpful. And that's why today we decided to share together. So um, on the first slide, I tried to explain to you just some of the things that I do um, throughout the presentation. We have to make the learning relatable and meaningful for the students. And we need to make them aware of some of the things that they're doing are already research. They're using their phones and their devices all the time. So um, I just kind of share with them through interactive sites like Nearpod or Pear Deck or Lumio and Smart Suite and Flipgrid. I want to make it interactive and have them be responding and engaged throughout the presentation. So this is just kind of a key points for engagement, if you will. This would be um, the beginning of my slide. I, I presentation, I usually throw out a question to the students to kind of get them involved. Um, and I ask them what their background knowledge is. Where do they go for research? And that way I kind of can sense the audience and see what sites I might need to go more in depth into, or if this particular group of students has a real key on reliable research already. So this might be something I would throw out um, using a, a Flipgrid or some other tool to get them involved. If it was live in the library, for example, or in a classroom, you know, they could write a quick write to respond to this question. I think it's very important for them to understand the domain names um, when things populate, when they search for information. So we go over um, what these things mean, .net, 
.com.org.gov. Dot edu, and I get a lot of different responses when I say, what do you think .NET means? And um, I get some very interesting answers. And then, of course, I get some very on-point answers as well. Some of the students really do know what those terms mean. But even in high school, sometimes they don't. And it's important to explain to them that a .com, for example, um, is a commercial site. And what do commercials do? Commercials try to make money. And so I try to instill in them an understanding of what those ending to the domain name um, things mean so that they get a better understanding for what's reliable. I also explain how those websites are ranked. Um, students don't necessarily know that the first thing that populates isn't always the best and that um, money is a driver for how they are ranked. Sometimes people pay to get a high spot. Um, Amazon, for example, they make a lot of money, so a lot of people use them. So because they get a lot of hits, they usually come up on top when you're searching for something to purchase, for example. Um, and then we talk about search settings and how within the sites, they can um, guide their search settings so that they don't necessarily get information at the top of their search that they're not looking for. I also try to uh, use political cartoons um, during some of my, my presentations with the students. And this one I use um, to kind of promote some critical thinking. Um, it is a game show background and I ask the students to just take a few minutes to think about it, read the caption and think about how this relates to searching for information and then getting something to populate. Um, and again, I get interesting answers for this, but some of the answers that I get are really right on. So um, obviously we talk about um, the one who shouts the loudest is the one who is heard. However, in researching also the top site is sometimes the loudest or the one with the most money. And we kind of make that, that correlation and do a little critical thinking um, using this. And I go into more depth, but I just wanted to show you an example of what I might use to kind of engage them some more. And to make it relatable, I usually um, throw out something that I want them to research that they're interested in. Um, in this particular one, I used uh, laptops uh, because this was last year when all the students, you know, needed devices because we were in our pandemic. Um, so I used laptops and I just had done a search, a screenshot and asked them to really look at the information provided for each of those items. Which one would they purchase if they had $1,000 um, to spend? What would they purchase? And um, we talked about looking at the reviews are very important, um, not only when you're purchasing things, but when you're doing research. Um, we talk about um, price and we talk about other things that are relatable to them and kind of taking it outside of the context of researching for a school project, but making it hit home for them so that they understand. Um, I might use a Google poll. Um, I might use another site, a Nearpod or something. And then I would ask them which item they would choose and I would have them explain to me why, again, either in a quick write or some kind of um, tool that I could progress monitor and look at my answers. We go over um, the CRAP method. I find this is an acronym that the students really can remember. Um, and that when they're searching for schoolwork, that the information should be current, reliable and relevant, um, we have to look at the authority of the information and the purpose and the point of view. And then I go in a little more detail on the next few slides. So we actually just discuss these questions um, and depending on the research that they're doing, does it have to be current? Um, is it something that just happened last month? Then it should be a current piece of information. Even if it's something that happened a hundred years ago, Maybe something has transpired within that time, so we may need current information. 
and we just go through those questions and um, share information. Also, the reliable re reliability and relevance um, of the information. We cover all of that. Who's the intended audience? And I explain that these things overlap um, in the CRAP method, that they may see the same type of question for the C, the R, the A, or the P, but we go over this into, in detail. And the author and authority, um, who is the publisher, who is the author, um, is that author an expert in that field? And we discuss how anybody can publish something or put something as a website. And many times people believe what they read or what they see, but that information may not be reliable and that person may not be an expert for that particular um, subject area or topic. So that kind of relates to our, our researching. And then they understand that they have to look beyond just the title of the work. They have to really look at the C, the R, the A, and the P before they choose their sources to use in their report. And then the P, um, the purpose and point of view, um, we go into this in, in quite a bit of detail. And there, um, we talk about bias a lot and how sometimes the way that things come across are trying to um, persuade you of certain information or that people or publishers even for that matter may have bias uh, for certain things. So they have to really distinguish between different sources and get their information from a reliable one in order to provide reliable information for their own report. Um, after that, I usually, uh, because it's kind of a big piece of the discussion, um, I would ask more questions. I would talk about maybe biography research and which of those CRAP they would find would be more, more um, important when doing that type of research. And I might also throw in the next slide, I might do a collaborative board for their answers or some other type of interactive uh, project. If it was live, I might have them um, do something with manipulatives or something hands-on, or I might have them even, um, you know, do something at their tables or a discussion amongst their peers um, for this one. And at the end of the uh, session, I always try to provide some kind of a, a summary or something that they see exactly what we were getting getting to, even though we discussed it throughout the way, um, that they need to be cautious. What populates first may not be the best, uh, may not be the most accurate, and that they need to use those verified sources and check those sources using the CRAP method or whatever method um, that you are teaching them. And after this piece, I usually go into the reliable sites in our portal that are um, provided for us by our school district but our wonderful media specialist, Deb Speck from Palm Beach Gardens High School just down the road will be covering that. And Deb, please take it away. Thank you. Hi everyone. So I'm Deb Speck. I'm at Palm Beach Gardens High School in Palm Beach Gardens in uh, the north end of the county. I'm gonna talk to you about a couple of things we do here on our campus. Everybody knows it's been um, crazy 18, 19 months now. So, I'm gonna share with you an easy way to introduce students to the research process. So I use SIRS. I've always been a big fan of SIRS from the very beginning, even when I was in elementary school. I use SIRS Discover. Now here uh, in high school, I use SIRS Researcher. I love the way it's organized. The graphics are very easy. It's very helpful to students. I say this very lovingly. Our ninth graders this year are, you know, they left in seventh grade and a lot, of, a lot of them have not been on a school campus until they came to us as ninth graders. So as we're getting everybody back on track and introducing research and research, one, research projects make students moan and groan, and two, students think that research is Google. The way SIRS is organized, it is very easy to navigate. 
And also I feel like it really makes it very easy for all levels of learner and any learning style. So I'm gonna go over the way SIRS is organized. So what does it look like? So it has um, ribbons for students to search using little graphics pictures. So it has 12 in each of the ribbons, trending topics, and those are topics that SIRS is constantly uh, collecting data from its users across the nation. And these are always the top 12 trending topics that students are looking for. And they change every time they glean new data, they change these. So one week you'll see mental health, health there, but maybe two days later, it's gone. So this is what their peers are researching. And then they have the editor's picks. And those are 12 topics that the editors feel that young adults in high schools should be aware of. So those are two easy ways for students to get started in the research process without having to dig too deep. They can look at these graphics and then they click on it. And what does it look like when they're ready to get down to work? So once they select a topic, and I selected homework because it makes them all moan and groan. So there's always at the top um, a summary, a really concise, uh, very clear summary of what is homework. Then it goes into an essential question, which you see there, should homework be abolished? And then there's viewpoint one and viewpoint two, the pro and the con. So I'm pretty sure that we would all agree that all students think that homework should be abolished. But as with any topic, you can't argue and support your opinion or viewpoint if you don't know both sides of the issue. So under viewpoint one, viewpoint two, there's a statement under each one. And then underneath, there are always three supporting articles. So they have to read both sides. So they're always going to read um, a collection of six viewpoints. So that now, no matter which side they're on, they are informed about the entire topic. So when the principal comes in and student government argues against homework, of course, the principal is going to argue for homework. But now you can have a discussion, a discourse about the pros and cons of the subject. So it's a really nice, concise way. When I ask students, why do you always have to read three pieces of evidence, um, view, um, pro or con? Oftentimes, they really don't know that they're actually searching for like information. So if the first one, one and two don't agree, then you move on to number three. So, but I can assure you that if you're using SIRS, they're all good and they're all going to be of like information, both sides, pro and con. So after you've read both sides of the um, essential question, there are going to be um, critical questions. There are usually between one and six, but usually four questions. So if you have read all six um, of the supporting documents, evidence for the pro and con viewpoints, you should be able to answer these questions and speak intelligently to them. If you need help choosing a topic, maybe the uh, ribbons for trending topics or editors pick aren't your thing. You can scroll down to the bottom of the page and then there is need help choosing a topic where um, up to there are 15 topics that will help you choose a topic. So I selected um, civil rights and liberties. Once I click on that, this is the screen that I see. So it keeps trying to help me narrow my topic. And you see across the top, there are tabs or there are graphics to help you choose again. So being the media specialist, I of course chose banned books. So when I click on banned books, it takes me again to the landing page for the topic. But now you see it starts with the summary. And also I want you to see that on the left-hand side, you can also listen, it will read the summary to you. I just have the abbreviated summary. And then you see for this is the essential question. Should school administrators or librarians have the authority to ban books? And then underneath that essential question, it's 
um, what I just showed you on the previous slide. It has viewpoint one and viewpoint two with the supporting evidence. Other features, um, every subject has a timeline. There's always a graphic. I really like this one, <laughs> if you take a minute to read it. But there are other related leading issues. You can search by publication, um, magazines, newspapers. You can define the timeline that you're looking for. You can also search for or only primary sources. So as your students move through the research process, and become better and more advanced in researching topics, SIRS moves along with them. But it's a really nice entry level so that students don't feel threatened by actually using our research database besides Google, because we all know Google's not really a research database. <laughs> so this is a really nice way to make them comfortable with the process. Every teacher, when assigning research, every teacher has criteria for what they want their students to do. But I end with this. If you have not listened to anything your instructor has said or didn't listen to the critical pieces of it, and now it's Saturday afternoon and it's due on Monday, or another really great feature of SIRS is that it has the research guide for the critical thinker. And you see that they are divided into six different um, areas. This is just a, an example of what the first one looks like to pick a topic. And so then it asks you to define uh, what is the purpose of your project. And then you answer these questions. It gives you tips along the way. Every single one of these, pick a topic, focus and separating all the way down to apply your knowledge. If you are using SIRS for research, and you download and print these or fill them out online, even if you don't remember exactly the parameters of the assignment, if you fill out all six of these and you get to the end to apply your knowledge, you will at least have a viable assignment to turn in at the end. They're very, very helpful. So now we're gonna move into searching for a career. This is a, um, paid subscription that I have through Gale. It's available to anybody, but again, it's paid. The price depends on the population at your school. So I don't really wanna share with you what I pay, although I will tell you that it's extremely reasonable. There are about 2,700 students on our campus and it's available to everybody 24 seven. So searching for a career. This is something that we're going to be focusing on with our ninth graders. Next slide, there you go. And so this is what it looks like. So again, the Gale tile is in our portal because we uh, as a district have a lot of really great databases from Gale, but this is what my uh, the specific one looks like, Peterson's Career Prep. And well, again, we are focusing right now with ninth, grade, ninth graders on having students register for an account and then finding a career. And of course, you're, are you thinking like ninth graders, really, can they find a career? I mean, they're, they're struggling to be back on campus and they're just getting back in the swing of things. No, we don't think that they're going to like choose a career in ninth grade and that's going to be it. We just want them to be thinking about realistically the choices that are available to them and what that career path might look like, whether um, you're headed off to college, university, or you really want to develop a skill. So once you sign in and create an account, you embark on your journey, which says my journey. And there are four different assessments. So you take each one of the assessments and this is what the assessment looks like. It starts very simply. And I always tell the students, do not overthink this. I think many of us have probably taken an inventory, a personal inventory, likes, dislikes, so I tell them, just don't overthink it. The first thing that comes to your mind, just answer it. As you move on, in each of the four assessments, the questions become a lot more targeted and, and require you to think a little bit deeper, to dig deeper. When you get done with all four of the assessments, this is what you're going to get. This is the feedback. 
So you see that their interest, um, the in, my interests, my values, my personality, my workplace preferences. When you are done with all of the um, answering all the questions for the assessments, you're going to get back these four um, results. And this is what it's going to look like. I chose to, as an example, to show you the interest. So um, I thought this was kind of interesting. Just on a personal side note, you see I have no orange for the bar for artistic, even though that's my first degree, but whatever. <laughs> so maybe I overthought the questions. But as I tell my students, don't worry about it because you can always retake those assessments. So here is what I got my results. When I click on it, then it breaks it down into, okay, based on how you answered that, here are the different subject areas that you might be interested in. So it looked like human services might be a good fit for me. So I clicked on human services and within human services are all these different careers that I might want to embark on. So just as an example, I clicked on the first one, directors, religious activities, and it brings up the job description. So it's a very clear job description. And on the job, what would I actually be doing? On the right, you'll see that for every job description, there's a video, a sal average salary, and the average job outlook, and also what kind of an education or technical education or uh, high school, whatever education you need, for that particular career is gonna be on the sidebar. All of the items on the sidebar to the right link out to different places. One of the things I want to show you that we then go on and teach is the occupational handbook. And when you click on the um, salary for your job when you're on the previous slide, it's gonna take you to what those careers look like across the country. And on that page, if you scroll up to publications, you will find this occupational outlook handbook. And right now the handbook is for, is for 2019 to 2029. So when searching the occupational um, handbook, there are three different ways that the students can search. Across the top, you see the ABCs. That's really enlightening to a lot of students. You know, a lot of students, they know they want to be an attorney. Um, they know they want to be an artist. They want to be an actor. They want to do something in the medical field. When you click across the top on any letter of the alphabet, it brings up under, you see I've already clicked on the letter W. It brings up underneath the letter W all the careers listed in the handbook that begin with the letter W. So that's I always tell students, you don't have to be bored this weekend. You can search the Occupational Outlook Handbook and see how many thousands of careers are available to you. But again, you can also browse occupations. And of course, I'll bet you already know that when we're looking, students always want to click on the highest paying. But we are I am steering them when I teach them this, how to navigate this handbook, that they ought to be looking at the most new jobs projected. That's where they need to be deciding, like, is there anything there that might interest me? If there is, what am I going to need to do that job? You see um, along the bottom, oh, I should also mention that next to that is the field of degree. So let's say they picked a medical degree. So that return looks just a little bit different because it will tell you about the medical degree, the different degrees underneath that, and the different schooling. It's arranged a little bit differently than highest paying, fastest growing, or most projected. And then across the bottom, frequently asked questions, a glossary, and I find that glossary to be uh, a great help to them. Almost every word associated with um, any kind of career from the average, the mean, um, resume, earnings, anything at all connected with a technical skill and job or college bound degree. It's a really nice comprehensive glossary. There's a teacher's guide for ways to teach the Outlook handbook and then the career outlook. So then when you click on any of these careers, you can see this is an example from when I clicked on W. 
I drive to Chicago every summer and pass many, many, many wind, windmills. So I just clicked on W when I was getting ready to teach this to see what it had to say about windmills. And I was pretty surprised to find that a wind turbine technician just needs to graduate from high school. It's a non-degree. You just need long-term on-the-job training. And their salary is almost $60,000. I thought that was really interesting. You can click across the top, the tabs, or you can just scroll down. All those tabs are underneath. But it gives you a nice summary of the pay, the education, number of jobs projected. And there's always a video. So this is a great job. But if you, <laughs> if you click on this, that video is semi-terrifying because it's from the top of a windmill. So you can't be afraid of heights if you think you want to be a wind turbine technician. So that's just a quick summary of what the Occupational Outlook Handbook looks like. Our school-wide goal this year as we re-enter and get everybody focused back on being successful in school and some tools to make them successful is beginning with the ninth grade students to make sure that they're exposed to the research process, critical thinking skills using SIRS, and that all of our students in grade nine would register and create an account for our career prep through um, Peterson's, which again is a Gale database. So these are two things that we're going to use to move forward. And I will also tell you that the career prep has other things. Um, within that Peterson's career, there are tools and it's anything from how to write a resume, how to write a cover letter, how to select a university. It's just that even though all those different things are available on the site, we just want them to be aware in ninth grade, everything that's available to them. And as they move through, we'll start tailoring more of it to specific 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. So that's an overview of what we're doing here at Palm Beach Gardens High School. We are so happy to be back on campus this year. If you have any questions, I'm easy to find. I think I'm the only spec in the district. And now I'd like to present Amy Armbruster from Sun Coast High School. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amy Armbruster. I am the media specialist, AKA school librarian at Sun Coast High School. Um, I'm going to reveal with you today what we do for research in the Charger Commons here at Sun Coast. Um, we are a little different than some high schools in our district in that most of our students are college bound. We are um, an Ivy World school. Um, our students start with the NYP program in grades nine and 10, which means they begin research straight away once they get here. So we have a lot to cover with them as freshmen. We also have a computer science program, math science and engineering, innovative interactive technology program. We offer ACE courses and 28 advanced placement courses. So I am very focused here at Suncoast as a research and reference librarian. I'm going to go through quickly to share with you some of the resources we have for our students and to talk to you a bit about how we support our faculty and our students in their goals. Let's get started. Okay, so this is um, our virtual library I designed for us when we went into lockdown in 2020, as most of our students were learning virtually, and I needed to make sure all of our resources were, were available for them online. I'm going to be focusing on those research resources, as I mentioned just a moment ago. So um, we're going to be looking at our databases and our ebook nonfiction collection that we started curating intensively last year. Um, and we're going to look at citation resources and um, some resources that I have provided for them at, for the research process, especially as many times our students are working at 2 a.m. or midnight and they don't have someone available to assist them. So I want to make sure I have something other than YouTube available for them um, online for, from our school. So let's start beginning. Um, we're going to begin with the research process. So um, I am a 28-year veteran as an English teacher and a school librarian. So I have lots of experience in the research process. So I put together the sweet 16 steps in the research process that I've been using for quite a few years now. Um, and I've modified it occasionally. So I put that here for our students to go through those sweet 16 steps that will guide them through um, a very effective research paper. And I tell them it will yield an excellent, don't guarantee an A, but when ex an excellent paper if they follow those sweet 16 steps. So I like to make that available to, for them. In addition, as I spoke, mentioned earlier, students are definitely using YouTube a lot. So 
I also go out and look for YouTube videos that I think will be effective for our students. And I use them sometimes with my instruction. Um, and I, of course, in context, but here's a couple of examples of those. Um, we'll look, first of all, this one on background reading. It's a YouTube video, um, and it actually talks about using Wikipedia. I know I said the Wikipedia word with academic research. That's a no-no, but guess what? They're going to do it. So we need to teach them how to do it intelligently and effectively. So this is from 2011. Like oh, That's kind of old for Wikipedia, but guess what? It still works. You can go through that and look at it yourself to see um, why I use it. And it talks about um, the fact that they can use it for some background reading for a topic they know nothing about. It helps them. I know you use it too. Um, but the gold is buried at the bottom. And so that's where they're going to have those links to those primary sources and effective resources that are authoritative and valid and reliable. And those are the ones they will go to to do research. And those are the ones that will appear on their Works Cited page. So I make sure they get that information there. Um, this is a little video that I found on developing a topic. It does a nice little job about um, about narrowing those topics. Um, it's a really short video. Um, and once again, YouTube does do that effectively. I don't always have time to create videos. So I like to find good ones that will grab, grab our students' attention. They have to be nice and short. Um, and so I like to refer them to those. And those change quite frequently. Um, the next thing I'd like to talk to you about is um, the tab that I have under research databases and eBooks. So once again, I am concerned with academic sources for our students. The hardest habit to break as freshmen is getting them off Google and into academic resources. So I really need to make this easy for them, uh, kind of like one-click shopping, and um, teach them how to do it effectively. So many of our teachers require students to have a print book in their possession um, for their research, especially our history teachers. And I've worked with um, developing our nonfiction ebook collection last year and also in persuading our teachers to understand that these books are just as effective and many times the very same titles that we find on the shelves in our libraries. So I've worked on developing that collection. So let's take a look at that real quick, quick. So here we are. Um, I, we have currently at Suncoast have 375 in our collection, working to build that. Um, I'm also working on curating our tabs by subject area. I've done one, have many more to go this year. Um, psychology ebooks and databases is here. Um, I plan to add history and environment, environmental science and others. Um, but currently, we're using the ebook search, which is a multi book search for a topic. And I'll demo that for you real quickly. Um, here, I'm going to perform a Vietnam War search. It's going to search across all of our titles, all 375. We're yielding over a thousand results. And we could narrow this with an advanced search with that feature. Um, we also can use search within feature, which kids really like a lot. Um, and they can also search by relevance um, or publication date, which is very important with those science topics. So let's go in and narrow that. I'm going to use the search within feature, and we're going to look for Agent Orange in the Vietnam War and yield the results of 34. So once I get students here, I like to show them that this is kind of like if I pull the book off the shelf and looked in the index or the table of contents, it would direct me to the pages on which I would find that information. Notice that's what it does for us here. So it's just like looking at a book on the shelf, but I'm looking at it on my computer and the computer is finding those pages and that information for me. So here is a sample. I went into Agent Orange here. And notice I love also that the Gale eBooks and the Gale databases give them more like this links, related subject links. So many times this will guide them into another subject they hadn't even considered for research, it's kind of like a little scavenger hunt. And um, I love these features for our databases. Look at some of our other features. We have highlights and note taking capability within the database, and then we can send it to our Google Drive. Um, we also have the site feature, which of course we love to use. So we're going to scroll through here. I'm just going to go to my next slide. Here's the citation tool. So notice it will cite in MLA, ninth edition we're up to now, if it started this summer, um, APA, Chicago, and Harvard. And we'll also export to Noodle Tools, which is a product we use here at Suncoast. Of course, kids are used to EasyBib, maybe Citation Machine, but we do subscribe to Noodle Tools for our students here. And we'll take a look at that in just one moment. They also can export to their Google Drive. Now, I tell students when you're using these tools, it's kind of like using a calculator for math. You still have to know what to plug in. It's just going to make your life a little easier. So they should still know that this could be correct, could be incorrect. They still need to understand MLA. And um, we do spend some time with that as well. 
So here we are um, with the rest of our databases. So we're going to leave eBooks behind now and go and take a look at some of our district purchase databases and our Sunco specialty databases. So these are some of the databases that the school district provides for us. Um, and these are great. These are comprehensive databases going to give us lots of resources like books, magazines, academic journals, websites, images, podcasts. Um, academic One file will give us academic journals, very similar to JSTOR, not quite as good as JSTOR, but um, very, very nice product. World Book Advanced is kind of like, well, the World Book Encyclopedia we used back in the day, a little more advanced now, um, but they still will go to Wikipedia instead if we don't direct them there. Um, so those are the district purchase databases. Here at Suncoast, we go above and beyond and use some of our um, IB and AP monies to purchase databases um, to help support our college level instruction. JSTOR is one of those that gives us academic articles, academic journal articles, also world history and environmental studies to support those IB programs. So we're going to go in now and take a look at JSTOR. Um, you can see that this, this is a subscription database that we pay for every year here at Suncoast to support our college level coursework. So um, here I prefer, I prefer the same search, Agent Orange and Vietnam War. Notice our academic content. We have journals, book chapters, research reports. We have downloadable PDFs unlimited with our subscription. That's important because you can go to JSTOR for free and get a, maybe about five a month, but you can't get unlimited downloads unless, unless you subscribe. That's important for students that are doing research and they have to do um, parenthetical documentation, those in-text citations, and they need a page number for direct quotes. So downloadable PDFs are very important for academic research and writing those papers. So we like our JSTOR. In addition, it does export to Noodle Tools, which is the product we use for inciting sources. And notice that we'll also give them the option to copy MLA or APA, which is typically what is used in high school. So here we are in our environmental studies database. This is another Gale product, similar to our Gale eBooks. I just wanted you to see what a results um, uh, list would look like, the types of references that we have here and that our students have the option to use. Notice it does select, we have one selected website with that search, but I can know that that website is going to um, pass the test for reliability, authority, currency, purpose, et cetera. So um, that is our Gale and Context database that we have to renew every year. Those eBooks, we, once we purchase them, we own them forever, but databases have to be renewed every year. Okay, so now let's talk about our citation resources that we offer our students here. So we, I did mention that we use Noodle Tools um, to help them, much like a calculator in math. We use Noodle Tools to help us um, cite sources correctly. But in addition, it also allows them to take notes and create outlines. They create little note cards that they can stack on their desktop, and then they can have outlines that they can then export to help them write their papers. And of course, it will it will export and um, create a works cited page in perfect format. And even the hanging indent will not be a pain with Noodle Tools. I did create some videos here. I created those. They're not the best, but they work. So, um, so we did have some sources to help them with that. So I wanted to show you what Noodle Tools looks like in case you haven't seen this product. So this is a screenshot from um, one of my project folders called Extended Essay 2022. The Extended Essay is a 4,000 word research paper that our students must pass to earn the IP diploma. Even if they've done four years of work and everything else, if they fail this paper, they do not earn the diploma. So it's very critical. They have really nice um, academic resources for their research to write those papers. And Noodle Tools helps them to organize themselves. So this is from um, my um, project folder entitled Extended Essay. Notice I've noted here that um, these are our, some sources. And notice how it tells me that um, this source came from um, Gale Academic One File. It's an academic journal. And then this one came from JSTOR. And then down here, I have another one from JSTOR. So you can see how I can export those directly into Noodle Tools. And then I also can build note cards. And then I, the students can actually take notes on those. They can have direct quotes on those, um, give them titles. And then they can give a tabletop view or detailed view of those note cards. See, we have here, this was dealing with ecotourism in Australia. And I have note cards like Reef Park reef shark population, Great Barrier Reef, etc. And then the outline feature allows them to start building that outline along the side. And then that would be able to be um, exported into a doc so that they could have that next to them as they write their paper. 
In addition, one of the best features is when you click on this little icon, you export it. Um, if you're if, when you've already set up letting them know that you're using MLA formatting, this is what it does for you. Drum roll, please. Perfect works cited page. Bam. No hanging in dent battle. Um, alphabetical order, MLA format. If you've chosen MLA as your um, as your formatting technique for this paper, so that's Noodle Tools. Some more tabs on my citation resources page would be the Purdue OWL, which is an incredible resource for papers, turnitin.com, which helps prevent plagiarism, helps us detect plagiarism as a school, and then our own writing lab here at Suncoast, where students actually peer edit and help one another with writing. Um, every year I collaborate with a school, I have a librarian from Palm Beach State College. This is our lib guide from last spring to help our students with their extended essay. This is Rachelle Harris. Shout out to Rachelle, um, who does a wonderful job working with our dual enrollment students. We have hundreds of students a year who take courses through Palm Beach State College. So our collaborative endeavors really help support our students. Um, this is the Cephalin Library Card. Um, every year I sign about 200 of our students up to own this card. Cephalin stands for Southeast, Southeastern Florida Library Network. And those are libraries that uh, all participate. Um, my students just have to be 16 years old. And they get one of these cards. They can go to any of the participating institutions and use their facilities and check out print books. They also can use their databases if they are on site. This is an example of some of our collaborative projects and papers that um, we do here at Suncoast um, from research in grade nine, of course, orientation so that they learn about everything they have in their tool belt for research. Um, our personal fitness classes also have to do research projects. Yes, that's very popular. Not at first, but it does become because it's fun. They design, they do research and design their own circuit training program to help, um, help them achieve a personal fitness goal. Next is um, our MYP personal project research through their world history classes. It's done every year. Our students have to create a, a, a personal project over the summer between their ninth and 10th grade year. And they have to do a lot of research in order to prepare for that project. We also have the one, one world essay that's completed through biology classes for the MYP program. Through various grade levels we um, and supporting internal assessments for the IB and MYP, um, students have lab reports and research papers to write, so we help support that. Um, we, we do research projects through our rural language courses. Um, our juniors and seniors, IB Extended Essay is a huge portion of my job here at Suncoast in research and reference librarianship to write that 4,000 word research paper that is um, such high stakes for earning the IB diploma. Of course, every day I work with small groups and individual reference work as required and on demand virtually and in person. So that's a little bit about how we do uh, research here in the Charter Commons at Suncoast High School. I hope it's been informative and helpful for you and have a great day. Wow, what an absolutely amazing session. I know I learned so much today about some of the available resources, the whole career tool, just all I can say is wow. Thank you so much to all three of our presenters for such an amazing session. I wanna remind everyone here today that right now we are in session C, so please join us back in the main area, the technologyconference.palmbeachschools.org at 1.45 for our very next session kickoff. But before you leave, I wanna make sure that you get entered to win for our door prize in our session. So you obviously must be present to win. The only way that you can win is if you uh, live here in the US, you must post the hashtag PBCTechConf right there on the third bullet right there in the chat. Um, and then this is gonna generate who our winner is for us. Um, you only need to do it once. It's not going to help you out by doing a bunch of different times. And it might actually get kicked you out of, the, of the, the chat. So go ahead and just type that in one time in the chat box. And that's going to enter you to win. Your winner, um, your, what you're going to do is email John Shoemaker at john.shoemaker at palmbeachschools.org um, when you won, when I've named the winner. Um, and that will get you your prize. What you're going to be winning today is a $50 Visa gift card from Connection Public Sector Solutions. Um, just a quick thank you to not only Co uh, Connection Public Sector Solutions, but all of our companies that have provided door prizes here at the conference. So I'm going to give you just one more minute to type into that chat box the hashtag PBCTechConf um, to get you entered into the chat. I'm going to give you just one more moment. Um, as we start to kind of taper off and making sure that everyone has the opportunity to enter. 
Um, and so what we're going to do is pick our winner for the day. We have our spinning wheel and our winner for today is Tracy Posey. Tracy Posey is the winner of a $50 gift card. Congratulations. We are so happy that you won. Please make sure that you email John Shoemaker your name and which session you attended, and we can ensure that you get your prize. So to wrap us all up, what I'd like to do next is bring up our presenters here today so they can close out our session before we continue on, give you some last thoughts before we finish up for the day. Deb, Allison. So thank you. It was great to have the opportunity to present to you what's happening in a small part, a small part here on our campus at Palm Beach Gardens High School. And I would like to plug your uh, keynote closing speaker, Doug Conopelko, who was once a greater gator here on our campus. Thank you, everyone. Glad you could join us today. Absolutely. So before we close out for the day, I want to just share with you the entire EdTech team that has made today's conference possible. I know that they've worked incredibly hard um, to make this a reality and to put all this together with all these amazing presenters. Um, so thank you all uh, for joining us today. Thank you for coming. Um, the very last thing I want to share with you today um, is just our closing remarks um, and just really delighted to have you all here. Thank you.